Last minute edition, we're going to talk a little bit about bug bounty programs, specifically the federal bug bounty programs, and how to get paid out. A disclaimer, always, right? Um, not the opinions of my current employer, not here with their support even. Um, these defects are only representative samples that may or may not exist. They may look like real defects, but they have been modified slightly, so uh, they're not the actual defects. Some of this content is from memory, some of it from my notes, neither of which are very good anymore, so please fact check me. I don't think I'm the smartest guy in the room. Call bullshit on me if you want, okay? We are talking about the federal government. Please leave your political opinions outside. Uh, again, aluminum foil deflector binning is not required and Kool-Aid not provided. I did sign NDAs, all kinds of agreements to do this. Uh, so a lot of this stuff, websites, URLs, defects, have been changed to protect the innocent, namely me. Please do not try this at home, and especially please do not try this at home without the express written consent of Major League Baseball, right? Make sure you have permission for when you're doing this kind of stuff. So what's the greatest thing about presenting at B-Sides? I get to talk about me, right? What the hell is a corpsman? It's the Marine Corps, the hospital corps. It's a corpsman, okay? Just so we get that straight. Uh, retired military. I was in the military from 1990 to 1998. I did combat, uh, combat and trauma medicine, got my BSN, did some training with the Marines, ran with the Marines for quite a bit, uh, plugged a few sucking chest wounds in Marines. That's just all ch chest wounds don't suck. But uh, I went to UVU when I got out, transferred my BSN to BSOCS. While I was there, I met a Romanian immigrant named Dimitri. Now, that's not our local Dimitri, if you guys know, know Dimitri. It wasn't him, but uh, we started hanging out, spent a lot of time together, started doing a lot of stuff on security just on the side as we were going through school. And he introduced me to this group of geeks that used to meet at the DCMI Center like once a month. So uh, that's how long I've been doing this, just on the side. In 1999, I started doing computers full-time. I've been doing hardware and software development and testing uh, for places like Unisys and Intel and Fidelity and EMC, now Dell. Yeah. And I actually started doing full-time application security in 2014, where I switched from QE architecture to security, to AppSec. So. I, some stuff on the side that I still do. I do a lot of CTS still. Uh, active member, active troll of DC801. And uh, a lot of bug bounty programs. So let's talk about the feds for a sec. The Defense Digital Service. August 11th, 2014, we established the United States Digital Service through a presidential executive order. Thanks, Obama, right? It was supposed to be a tech startup within the federal government. Um, just so you know, it's, it's under the executive branch, the U.S. Digital Service, and then the Defense Digital Service. And their mission is to apply best practices in technology and design to improve the usability and reliability of our government's most important digital services. What that actually means is, let's try and pull some of the government's network out of the 70s and apply modern uh, processes to it. One of those being bug bounties, right? So uh, in March, they said, we're going to have this whole hack the Pentagon program. You can come in and hack the Pentagon. Um, they announced it through Hacker One's going to manage that for them. The scope was anything defense.gov plus the defense video network, uh, the Armed Forces Radio Network or Armed Forces Entertainment Network, AFN, and the Defense Imagery Network, which is kind of like the DVIDs, but for just images. Uh, later that year, they announced Hack the Army, which actually started in late November, just 2016, and finished in uh, late December, just a couple of months ago. Scope was goarmy.com. Uh, everything mobile.goarmy.com. There's this uh, Sergeant Star, which is uh, like a virtual training sergeant that runs all across the Army's websites. Uh, just a little JavaScript thing that just like runs the whole gamut of the domain. It's really interesting. But uh, these program participants, like myself, were vetted through resumes and job applications as if you were applying to, uh, uh, an app uh, applying to a job, background checks and uh, other methods by Hacker One, so whatever they had access to by working with the Department of Defense. And if nothing else, they learned these people that they were vetting, they got analytics on them. 
what are their tools, what are their signatures, what do they do, how are they attacking us? So that in itself could be useful, right? You know, as an organization, just looking at, let, let people hack us and just figure out what exactly they're attacking and how they're attacking it. Okay, we talk about low-hanging fruit in development, right? It's a timing check for me. So, first defect we're gonna talk about, like I called low-hanging fruit, okay? This is one of those easy sauce stuff, right? So I used an intercepting proxy, Rip Suite Pro in this case. I went in and I set the scope that was given to me for defense.gov and uh, turned on the scanner and the spider and turned off interception so I could actually just start browsing the site. And I just browsed the site through what looked like a normal user pass for about 10 minutes and then turned that browser off, went back into Burp Suite and says, all right, what are the tens of thousands of requests that just happened? Sort those by response type, response size, you know, everything you can think about the individual requests that go to a website and get answered. And I see this one that's like, that's supposed to be a request for favicon.png. Now that's that little icon that shows up in your browser and it should be like this tiny little thing, right? There's this huge request for it. Well, what the crap is that? So going to look at that in my browser again manually, that does not look like favicon.png, right? Now, when you see that on a defense.gov website, what's your first thought? What have I just stepped into, right? So in actuality, it was not a honeypot. Well, but side note, what is a honeypot? Something that's set out there to something that's easy, it's low-hanging fruit, maybe it has some data that looks valid to keep you from, you know, going hitting the real stuff, right? So we'll leave that open for, you know, debate whether it was actually a honeypot or not. So if we go back to that page, what actually happened there? Some analytics developer, brand new guy, probably left a back door in there disguised as favicon.png. So part of that, we're gonna watch what these hackers do, we're gonna go in and we're gonna track them, we're gonna see what their tools and their signatures are. Let's set up another analytics program so we can see that even better, <sighs> but let's not secure it. So what are the problems with that page? There's just this, this page sitting out there with a login on it that we don't know is there, we're not controlling it, we don't have any analytics against it. What about plain text off, right? That was an HTTP page asking you to log in. Stopped there, wrote a bug. Hey, hey guys, that's bad, okay? Wrote another one, says, oh, by the way, there's a password recovery there that's in plain text also, that's bad. So I start looking at that page a little bit more. There was a key on that page that said Piwik. I said, oh, all right. Next step, Google, what is Piwik? Now, disclaimer here, nothing against Piwik. It's an open source analytics software framework. Uh, I'm not saying that they're bad or insecure. I'm just saying that uh, this was an out of the box deployment of it. And so not bad software, bad DevOps. Go out and I start Googling around Piwik find that they're more than happy to give you the default users and passwords on their support site. When you set up Piwik, stand it up right out of the box, here's your admin, and here's your admin user and password. Oh, crap. Is that gonna work? Oh, stop here. Hey guys, this is really, really bad. Okay? So there's you know, a couple of defects that I wrote against it already. The documentation also said, oh, out of the box, here's your MySQL creds. All right, uh, so let's, let's throw a blind MySQL timing attack at it, you know, just, just out of curiosity, yeah. Positive for MySQL. Stopped here, wrote a defect. Hey guys, Michael, you, you, you have MS SQL injection here, so this is really, really, really bad now. So about this time I get a response from the bug scrub. It's just analytics. This isn't the defense website that you're hitting. This is an analytics site, come on. We can't pay out for, for hacking an analytics site, can we? So at this point, I'm like, oh, come on. Kid gloves come off. What kind of damage can you do with analytic data? It's not the actual site. It's just metadata about the actual site, right? 
<sighs> what do you track with the analytics? Who was there, where they came from, what they were doing, how long they sat on each page, who logged in. So I start, you know, I, like I said, I, I was kind of miffed at this point. It's like, no, nah, it's just analytics. It's nothing real, you know? So I start pulling tables. Start pulling out the uh, SQL map. Pulling out the big guns there. Oh, look, here's the Pewik users table. And since we already had the usernames, default usernames and passwords, it wasn't hard to figure out that, oh, yeah, these hashes, <laughs> they're SHA-1 hashes. And the salt, yeah, it's just the usernames. <laughs> So, but once again, you know, that wasn't real consistent. I, I started trying to guess new ones, and it wasn't working out very well. So, you know, as with any crypto technology, more time, more samples, more success, right? From the three users that I had that were just defaults there, it, that's what it looked like for real. And, oh, by the way, you, so I thought, anyways, since that was unpredictable, you know, I couldn't really say, you know, this was actually the hashes and... I start pulling a few more tables. Oh, this one is another users type table. It has the emails, the usernames of the admins of the actual site. So what are we tracking with analytics? Who's logging in? How often? From where? Okay, that's something we can work with. That's the table I end up sending to him an email. <laughs> so stopped here, updated the previous defects, and said, all right, if this isn't that big of an issue, who is Sergeant so-and-so at army.mil? Looks like he's logged in here. Oh, okay. We agree that's bad. And oh, by the way, you guys are stupid because you're not doing any egress filtering. So there, take that. Anyways, that's, that's the low-hanging fruit bug. There's another one here we can talk about. Who knows their Dante? What a pervert. Deception. Or treachery. The ninth circle of hell for Dante, right? This one, I think you'll figure out why I called it that. Tools used, some simple online encoders and decoders, along with 17 plus years of trial and error and instincts in testing software, making software, making hardware. No automated tools or scanners or proxies would work because of the web application firewall in place and the IDS, IPS that were in place. So, I, I mean, I did use Colasoft Packet Builder, if you guys ever use that just to really verify the existence of the web application firewall and the IDS and IPS. It wasn't really, you know, just, just getting the right pings back, making sure I'm getting the right packets back. So, but in all actuality, this three-week engagement, about two to three hours every night, and maybe 500 to 600 requests every night, manual requests in my browser. So, just to give you an idea of just how long it took me to put this together. Now let's step back a little bit, software test methodology. You run a test, you get an expected result, which is good, an unexpected result, which is bad, and then sometimes you get a really foobard way off out there, right? This is the expected result if you throw crap against the Army's website. Oh, we can't answer that, we don't know what that is. Okay, this is unexpected. You throw some crap against their website, you probably can't see that very well. That's a server error 500. Oh, we don't like what you did. It kind of broke some stuff on the inside, and we're not going to tell you anymore. And then there's the really broken. Um, you don't have permission to do what you just asked me to do, so go away. All right, so following that through manually with your requests. So I write a defect. There's a SQL injection vulnerability in this fake URL. By inserting a no flash tag, a base64 encoded href, an MS, MS SQL query, logic error, declaring a variable with a hexadecimal encoded string, get down to the MS execution layer. At this point, it's a matter of ethics. I could use different encoding strings, statements to find the scope of the users, show their tables, drop a table. So that was right out of the defect, right? Their initial response. We don't believe it. Uh, we can't reproduce that from here, but we're behind the firewall on the IDS, so yeah, we'll, we'll work with you on it. Comes back, well, it works on my machine. Okay. 
Uh, when we run these requests at your site index, we get a 404 on everything. We don't get the 500. We don't get the forbidden. And finally, fine. If you have a SQL injection, send us the SQL version and we'll believe it. We'll pay you out. Challenge accepted. So, reproduction steps, part of the defect that I wrote. On the fake URL, there's an embedded flash video. There's like a, you know, video.flv on there, right? They discreetly provide a no flash solution. So, make this request. Somebody can read that before I change the screen. No, sorry, moving on. All right, <laughs> here's the same request in plain English for uh, you know, sake of brevity and time. Let's walk through it, actually. Two different requests. So start with the base URL, base href, right? There, it has the embedded flash video in there. Dot no flash. Hey, website, I don't have flash. Can you display the following content without flash? Let me figure out that if you ask for that video manually, you say, hey, give me this, you, give me this video in, in, your, in your URL, in your browser, it can't find it. So it's not just out in some directory structure. It's in the database. So hey, I don't have Flash. Can you show me this video? No Flash dot the base64 encoded href that the Flash is on, that, that Flash video is on. All right. So I don't have Flash. Show me this without Flash. Pull it out of the database, basically. Then throw a URL encoded MS SQL logic error at it. You know, the, the standard MySQL, MS SQL breakout, right? Close what you're doing and start a new one. Now that we have a new SQL line, I want to declare a bucket. That bucket should have 200 of these things in it. He's okay with that. That had to be URL encoded, by the way, so did the next one. My bucket is Q and should contain the following. Stuff this hex encoded ASCII Wait for delay, zero hours, zero minutes, 10 seconds, into my bucket. When I execute that one, I get an 11 plus second delay on the site. All right, we're on to something. But if I actually say, give me the, you know, if I stuff the hex encoded ASCII of at, at version in my bucket, yeah, now I get this, just this plain white page that says 12.2.5000. Anybody know their MS SQL? They're, they're MySQL versions. That's the current version of MS SQL. And then after we send that in our, you know, we, we populate what our bucket is. We say, all right, execute my bucket. So that's the one that's like, who would do that? You know, that, that's the one that took two to three hours every night of just mashing with these strings to figure out how to get past the IDF, or the IDS, how to get past the web application firewall, how to get access to that database where that flash video was being stored. And so this is one that provided a big payout just because it was a remote code injection. I can sit outside and have you execute code. So just returning that MySQL version string was what their test was, right? But what you really came for, how can you get payouts from bug bounty programs, right? Who's in QA already? Who sits and tests software all day, every day anyways, right? Okay. A lot of the stuff is going to be seem familiar to you. Know how the software gets deployed. So if you were working on this software, if you were building and deploying this, how would you do it? That's a key. Be good at finding and writing defects and doing it quickly. We'll talk about that. Um, so make your defects clear and concise, you know, short, sweet, absolutely upfront. Make them easy to read. Code and screenshots come afterwards as attachments so they can just go read it right through. Make your defects easy to understand. Don't assume they know what you're talking about. Don't assume they know the technology that you're working with. Don't assume they even speak English. And do it all quickly because you don't get paid out for duplicates. Now, testers instincts, hackers instincts, right? You've, seen all, you've all seen those applications that just don't feel right. They, you, know, you follow that bad smell, right? That's how you get that last one. There's a bad smell in there. If you put a no script in here, something kind of funky 
comes through the application. You follow that through and you start pushing it harder and harder and harder and then you find something out at the other end. So follow that bad smell, use your instincts and critical thinking. Know when to stop, either because you're toast, it's one o'clock in the morning, or because you're banging your head against a brick wall, this isn't really going anywhere, you got to a certain point and then actually they've secured it now, or because of ethics and scope. Don't cross that line or you'll never be asked to come back, right? but also know when to push harder. That's how you get paid out. Know when to push harder against the application and against the reviewer. Now these reviewers, I, I may have painted them in the wrong light here. They don't do this just to be mean. They do this to test your conviction to your bug. How convinced are you that this is a problem? And they're going to test that. So be prepared to defend your defects. Know how to use those free and open source tools. The Hashcat, Burp Suite, SQL Map. No, 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 you're not all those tools in Cali, holy crap. But uh, just know how to use the tools that you're going, you know, at least one tool in your toolbox, right? One of each kind. Be non-destructive. That user's table in email goes a hell of a lot farther than a crashed application. Dropped database. And finally, stay within the boundaries boundaries of your ethics and your scope that they give you. Once again, you'll be asked to not come back. Thank you, Meta, for this. Danny, if you're in the room, thank you. I guess I'm supposed to be the guy with the purple snuggly there, but uh, whatever. I'm okay with it. Questions about federal bug bounty programs, these hacks in particular. I think we've got about three or four minutes before Leslie comes and kicks me off the stage. I don't think they mean to be combative. The, the question is, is, if you have a reviewer or a bug scrub board that tends to be combative, and you know, I say you have to defend your defects, how do, you, how do you prepare for that, or how do you even preempt that? And I guess the answer really is, is be prepared to defend your bug in the first place. When you write your bugs, know what you're talking about, and put it in a way that it's very clear and concise and give it good reproduction steps. This is how I did it. This is how you can do it. Now, there was one here that they just said, we're behind the firewall, so it's not gonna work for us. You just, you know, you just gotta convince us. But uh, it's, try not to think of it, you know, like I said, they're, they're really not trying to just be a dick about it. They're, they're just trying to protect their client's interest, to make sure that this really is something that's as bad as you say it is. And that uh, they're not going to end up paying out on a bunch of just crap bugs that really aren't there. So yeah, just be prepared to defend your bugs, really, and expect them to push back a little bit at least. Other questions? No? All right. Go ahead. Oh, you know, I didn't bring pictures of them. Um, they're on my Twitter. I did put my Twitter up there earlier. When you get a payout from these guys, you also get coins, little challenge coins, little, you call it hacker street cred if you want, but I don't know. They're uh, pretty cool, they're pretty nice. Um, those who are close to me, you've seen them before probably, you know, I come and I pat myself on the back and brag about them almost daily, right? So more than anything, I use them for my imposter syndrome. This reminds me that, yeah, I am that guy. Go ahead. It's possible, you know, and uh, you know, like I said, in order for me to actually get down, and granted, I was probably emotionally beyond that line at one time, that uh, where they said, you know, it's just analytics. There's nothing wrong with that, really, right? When I start and I dive down and I sign, you know, Sergeant So and So at Army.mil, and you know, get this list of ten actual people who log into there on an admin, people that work in the Pentagon every day, and they're logging into this application daily. Yeah. But that's why they go through the Hacker One in the first place. That's why Hacker One manages it for them. If you do step across that line, if you do see something that you probably shouldn't have, that's part of the NDA. You know, you don't you just you don't go talking about it. You don't go telling them about it. But that's just part of the vetting process too. 
So they want to make sure that if you do step over that line, if you do see something you didn't see, you're still at least a trustworthy, semi-trustworthy, reputable person. So, and they do have, like I said, pretty extensive NDAs and uh, uh, other agreements there. So, other questions? All right. Thanks for your time today, guys, and thanks, Rob, for giving me your time. Rob, if you're in the room, again, thank you. <laughs>